or whatever questions you might have. Um, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, thank you for worshiping with us this morning. Um, we've been in a series in Nehemiah, um, and we're, we're getting closer. We've been at it for a few months. And um, just to review, if you haven't been with us throughout the series, Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah, is um, <clears throat> the story of Nehemiah, um, if you didn't know already. Uh, he was serving as um, wine tester for the king, the king of Persia. He was in exile. And um, there was a, a time when his brother, brother, you know, his kin came back from Jerusalem and brought a report of the destruction that had happened in Jerusalem. The walls were down, the defenses were down, and so he was broken by it because he knew that there was... Um, there was no protection for the city or for the people, and he, he mourned and he grieved over that. And, and he, was, um, he felt like this burden over that. And so he prayed for months. He wanted to do something about it. He went before the Lord, prayed about it, and there was an opportunity. There was a day that he came, and, um, and it the grief and the burden you could, could be seen on his face and his demeanor. And so the king asked him, what, what's going on with you? I haven't seen you like this before. And so all of those months of preparation led to this point, and he gives one more little prayer saying, like, Lord, what we've been talking about, here it is. And the opportunity presents itself, and he unloads on the king and says, man, this is what's going on back in my homeland. The defenses are down. There's no walls. My people are being persecuted. The Lord prepared all this, prepared the king, prepared the situation so that God could intervene through Nehemiah for the people. So the king, just all the resources that Nehemiah needed and more, anything that he could uh, need on the way he provided. He provided an army. He provided soldiers, a pass so that he could get through certain territories, and money so that he could buy material and build up the wall again. And, but it wasn't easy. It wasn't just like get there and start building. There was pushback. There, there was scheming and planning and scare tactics to prevent people, the people of God, from building that wall. There was others there that had been in authority and their authority was being threatened and there was all kind of secret tactics trying to keep him from doing what he was sent to do. But the Lord intervened and in 52 days, 52 days the wall was built all around the city. And the way that it was accomplished is every person, every family, every um, leader of his household took him and his family, whoever was capable of working, and they built right in front of their home. They were, he used good tactics, right? There was a sense of urgency in protecting each family's home. So they built, they built right in front of where they lived taking care of the family. And in 52 days, it got built. It got done. Led by the Lord himself. But that, that wasn't the end. There was like, there's, you would think, right, that the building of the wall is it, that's done, it's settled. No. There was stuff to be worked out even within the people of God. See, certain people had more advantage, had some resources more than others, had land, had money. And those that had less were being taken advantage of. And so Nehemiah addresses that and said, man, this isn't right. And so they're like, oh, you're right. I mean, it probably wasn't that quick or that easy. But they saw that what Nehemiah was saying was right, and so they changed their ways. And they, the, if they were collecting interest or if they had loaned money, they 
they no longer did that. They didn't overwhelm the people with the burden of their debt. But the people outside that were threatened because of the building of the wall, they weren't done yet. They were more threatening. Finally, the wall is built. The city is secure. And this is the place where we find ourselves. They had this great revival. And they called Ezra. The book of Ezra is right before Nehemiah. And uh, originally, the manuscripts were one book, Ezra, Nehemiah, Ezra slash Nehemiah. It wasn't one and the other. So all of these events kind of took, uh, happened simultaneously. Um, the telling of the story, sometimes it's not in order. There's a little bit of jumping around. The main purpose behind it is not the order in which things happen. It's the, the fact that these hit things happened. And so... Ezra, being the theologian of the time, was asked to bring out the book. The book. The law of God. So Ezra brings it out, and they study, they go through an expository reading of the word. That means you go through it, a book at a time, a chapter at a time, a verse at a time. And then they had not, it wasn't, it was certain people reading it. If, like in the next couple of weeks, some of you want to volunteer and just read for me. We're getting into some crazy names. I would appreciate your help. So anyway, so certain people, that was just detour. Okay. Um, there was these people that were reading it. And then there was these other people that were explaining and teaching, and this is what it means, and this is where we failed as a people, and this is where we've messed up, and this is where we need to go. A clear instruction of the Word of God. Nothing added on, nothing taken away. It's what's in black and white. And when they saw this, a couple of weeks ago, we saw this, that um, they got to this part where Man, we have failed in practicing the Feast of Booths. We have neglected to do what the Bible is instructing us to do, what tradition has instructed us to do, so that we might remember what the Lord has done in our life, in our people, in our ancestry, how faithful he has been. We've, man, we've not been doing this thing right. So they repent and they change their ways. And this is still going on. This is a continuance of what we have seen of late. Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 16 through 38. We're going to pause for prayer uh, because we're going to do the same thing as last week. We've got, yeah, 16 through 38 is what we're reading today. So that's a good chunk of scripture. So instead of reading it all, and then coming back and going through it again and teaching, we're just going to go a section at a time. So pray with me this morning. Lord Jesus, you are good. You are so good. You're an awesome God. You are, you are our provider, our redeemer, our savior. took on the weight of the sin of the world, took on flesh. Know, you know what it is to suffer, not by just being a sovereign God, not by um, knowing all things because you are creator, but because you also walked here on earth, had friends, had family, there was betrayal, there was loss, there is death, hopelessness, poverty. You experienced it all, and you saw it in others. You were broken for them. You know what it is 
to be man. Lord, you know us well. You know the depths of our hearts. You know how much we need you. You know us intimately, and yet you love us. Continue to do a good work in our lives, Lord. Your word says that you will finish what you've started. Continue to work in us, God, molding us into your image. Be with us this morning in our study and reading of your word. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Nehemiah chapter 9, starting in verse 16. But they and our fathers, I'm going to go back just a little bit. Back to what we covered last week. This is uh, Nehemiah chapter 9. We're still in chapter 9. Just the the end here before, um, starting in verse 9 just so we know where we're at. And you saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and heard their cry at the Red Sea and performed signs and wonders against Pharaoh and all his servants and all the people of his land. For you knew that they acted arrogantly against our fathers. And you made a name for yourself as it is today, and you divided the sea before them so that they went through the midst of the sea and dry land, and you cast their pursuers in, into the depths as a stone into a mighty waters. By pillar of cloud you led them in the day, and by a pillar of fire in the night to light for them the way in which they should go. You came down on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven and gave them right rules and true laws, good statutes and commandments. And you made known to them your holy Sabbath and commanded them commandments and statutes and law by Moses, your servant. You gave them bread from heaven for their hunger, for their hunger and brought water for them out of the rock for their thirst. And you told them to go in to possess the land that you had sworn to give them. But they and our fathers acted presumptuously and stiffened their neck, did not obey your commandments. They were instructed, they were, set, they were told Go, the land is yours. Go. Go take possession of it. Go. We're told to go and make disciples. Go and tell the people the good news of the gospel about this great king that we serve. Go. But... They and our fathers acted presumptuously and stiffened their neck and did not obey their commandments. They refused to obey and were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them, but they stiffened their neck and appointed a leader to return to slavery in Egypt. Isn't that crazy? The land is there. And a couple of the spies were like, yeah, these guys are right. There was 10 of them. Eight of them were like, no way, we can't take on these giants. Two of them were like, yes, we can. God is going before us. We can go into this land. They're like, "Mm mm-mm, nope, 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 nope. Not going in. Not only are we not going in, we're going to find a guy that takes us back to Egypt. We'll be slaves again. You know, we got good exercise building brick back there. You know, a whip every now and then is not as bad as being just stepped on by these giants.
They stiffened their neck and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. But you are God. That is amazing. That is amazing. We we fail. We fail as followers of Christ on a regular basis. But God, but God, but you are God, ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. You imagine our behavior now, the way that we behave as Christians, if we were in Old Testament time when, boom, people got lit up like that, or the earth opened up and swallowed you up for disobeying. We see it with Achan. They were instructed, don't take anything for yourself. They were at war. They went to war. The people of Israel went to war, and Achan just snuck in a little piece of something. He went into his tent, hid it where nobody else could see it. Nobody saw him do it. It was only him and God. Smoked just like that. Go make disciples. Go tell people about the God that you serve. Now, God, you know what? There is a football game going on today. I'm not going to tell anybody anything. Boom, smoke, just like that. Wouldn't that be awesome? Bring out your marshmallows. You are God, ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and did not forsake them, even when they had made for themselves a golden calf. You will not have any other gods before me. Moses goes, gets the Ten Commandments, comes back. They are worshiping a cow. Can't leave them alone for five minutes can't leave us alone for five minutes. Right? Worshiping the golden calf and said, this is our God who brought up, who brought you up out of Egypt and had committed Great blasphemies. They committed great blasphemies. You and your great mercies did not forsake them in the wilderness. Could have just left them there. I am tired of these people. Just going to leave them out in the desert. But he's good. He did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud led them in the way in the way did not depart from them by day, nor the pillar of fire by night to light for them the way by which they should go. You gave your good spirit to instruct them and did not withhold your manna from their mouth and gave them water for their thirst. There was nothing to eat. They could have died, but the Lord provided on a regular basis. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness, and they lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out, and their feet did not swell. They were walking all over the place. You know, they could have had issues with their feet. They didn't. Their clothes did not wear out. You know, sometimes as a father, you kind of long for that sort of thing. Kids right now seem to be going through different sizes all at once. Lord, let their clothes stretch out or something. And you gave them kingdoms and peoples and allotted to them every corner 
So they took possession of the land of Sihon, king of Heshbon, and the land of Og, king of Bashan. He forgave and gave them opportunity. Possession of the land and of peoples and of kingdoms. He expanded their ter territory. You multiplied their children. That is a huge thing. Within this culture, it is a huge thing. It is a blessing to have a huge family, to have lots of offspring. You multiply their children as the stars of heaven and you brought them into the land that you had told their fathers to enter and possess. So the descendants went in and possessed the land, the descendants, because the original people that were like, we're going back to Egypt, they all died off. They were not allowed into the land because of their disobedience. But their kids were able to go in. So the descendants went in and possessed the land, and you subdued before them the inhabitants of the land the Canaanites, and gave them into their hand with their kings and the peoples of the land that they might do with them as they would. And they captured fortified cities and rich land and took possession of houses full of all good things, cisterns already hewn, vineyards, olive orchards, and fruit trees in abundance. So they ate and were filled and became fat and delighted themselves in your great goodness. They were in a good place. Abundance. Anything they could imagine they had. Well fed. They were in a good place. Twenty-six. All is going right. The Lord has provided. He has taken care of them. Nevertheless, ah, I hate that word. Don't you? Everything is going good. Nevertheless, verse twenty-six. They were disobedient. As a kid, I was like, "Man, can you guys not just get it together?" when I was being taught as a little boy in Sunday school. They messed up. Lord saved them. They're good. Messed up. Lord saved them. Like, why can't they just obey? Of course, I was probably disobedient myself, you know. I, you know, I probably just did something to my little brother or something, you know. I was always doing something to my little brother. I'm just letting you know. They were disobedient and rebelled against you and cast your law behind their back. This isn't for me, man. And killed your prophets. They had the law of God. Lots of warning. And then they had people to come and preach and instruct the law of God. Turn from your wicked ways. One after another, God was sending his men, his servants, to turn the wicked people back to God. And they killed them. One after another. Instead of paying attention to the warning and turning from their wicked ways. No. I killed your prophets who had warned them in order to turn them back to you. They committed great blasphemies. Therefore, you gave them into the hand of their enemies who made them suffer 
And in the time of their suffering, they cried out to you. And yet again, you heard their cry. You heard them from heaven. And according to your great mercies, you gave them saviors who saved them from the hand of their enemies. They messed up again. God intervenes. Because he's faithful. He is faithful to hear our cry. Amen? Here's the thing, and the sense of urgency is that we are not promised tomorrow. Do you remember that story about the guy that had a great piece of land, had a great crop, and he goes and he's like, man, I'm going to tear down these old storehouses so that I can collect all of this stuff I'm going to build bigger barns. And then I'm going to just chill, kick back, get my lawn chair out, get my cigar. That's a life. Maybe go down to the beach and collect seashells. Jesus is instructing his disciples with that story, and he says, You fool. You will not see tomorrow. So there's a tension, right? God is merciful. He's the God of second chances. And second chances that don't make any mathematical sense whatsoever, right? Because we mess up, and he gives us another opportunity. We mess up, and he gives us another opportunity. But we're not promised tomorrow. There's that tension. The word of God is before us so that we may learn. It was for them. It was for his people. It was for that time. But it's also for us so that we may listen to the warning because we're not promised tomorrow. You heard their cry and gave them saviors who saved them from the hand of their enemies. But after they had rest, you see what I'm talking about? Everything's cool. The Lord provides a way out through someone or some miraculous thing. But after they had rest, after they were chill, everything's cool, right? We're good to go. They did evil again. After they had rest, they did evil again before you, and you abandoned them to the hand of their enemies. There you go. That's what you want. There you go. So that they had dominion over them. Their enemies had dominion over them. Yet when they turned and cried to you, you heard them. He saves them again. Many times you delivered them according to your mercies. Merciful God. Gracious God. And you warned them in order to turn them back to your law, yet they acted presumptuously and did not obey your commandments. Sin against your rules. Which if a person does... them the rules he shall live by them and they turn a stubborn shoulder and stiffen their neck and would not obey and that bible it's just suggestions honestly i mean i think it might have been good for that time or for a different time maybe back in the in the early 1900s maybe that was a good time for it but we man we got to get with the program this is what is this 2018 Come on. I had to check with myself. It was 2018. The 
They turned a stubborn shoulder and stiffened their neck and would not obey. Many years you bore with them and warned them by your spirit through your prophets, yet they would not give ear. Therefore you, have, you gave them into the hand of the people, peoples of the land. Nevertheless, in your great mercies, wow, amazing, you did not make an end of them or forsake them, abandon them. You did not abandon them. For you are a gracious and merciful God. Now, therefore, our God, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love, let not all the hardship seem little to you that has come upon us, upon our kings, upon our princes, upon our priests or prophets, our fathers, and all your people since the time of the kings of Assyria until this day. Yet you have been righteous in all that has come upon us. We can't hold it over your head. There is no guilt on you, Lord. This is all because of us. You have dealt faithfully, and we have acted wickedly. We have to take a sober look. I'm just pausing here at verse 34. We really have to take a sober look and not think better of ourselves and say, man, well, I'm not so bad. I'm not as bad as that guy. Because the ultimate goal is Christ. We are being shaped into the image of Christ. We are talking about it this morning. Originally, in the beginning, in Genesis, we walked with him in the cool of the day, in the garden. We as mankind, Adam and Eve, created in his image. And the story of the world is Old Testament, tradition, sacrifices, Stories that point to Christ, that predict there is a Savior coming, Christ coming to take on our sin. And when we accept Christ, there is salvation. When we abide by his word, when our actions change, when our life is transformed, the rest of our life is a growing up. Being born again is that when you are saved, you're just a baby drinking milk. You have to grow up. You have to get into some meat and some vegetables. I don't like broccoli, but we have to get in it. I've got to grow up about my broccoli thing, right? He says, yeah. We need that nutrition in our life. And that means that we expose ourselves to being ridiculed because we're telling people about Jesus. We expose ourselves for our king. We are representing a king, our savior. You might be from Del Rio or the surrounding area or somewhere in these United States, but you're not American and you're not Texan or whatever. Your citizenship is in heaven. And you've been given an assignment by your king to tell people about him. How are we doing on our assignment? When we go back, and we will go back and report to him, face to face. Oh, Lord, you know that. Just it, it intervened with the Cowboys game, you know? Or HGTV Rebuild It channel or something. We have no excuses. 
We got to represent the king. We have acted wickedly. Verse 34, our kings, our princes, our priests, and our fathers have not kept your law or paid attention to your commandments and your warnings that you gave them. Even in their own kingdom, and amid your great goodness, they're surrounded by all these great things, the land that you promised them. We're surrounded, surrounded by all these great things. His promises. We have an abundance of things. As, as a people and as a church. Huge facility. Amid your great goodness that you gave them, in the large and rich land that you set before them, they did not serve you or turn from their wicked works. Behold, we are slaves this day in the land that you gave to our fathers to enjoy its fruit and its good gifts. Behold, we are slaves. And its rich yield goes to the kings whom you have set over us. This is the sovereignty of God. He knows the kings that are ruling over them. He knows their oppressors. Whom you have set over us because of our sins. They rule over our bodies and over our livestock as they please. And we are in great distress. Because of all this, we make a firm covenant in writing on the sealed document are the names of our princes, our Levites, and our priests. That leads into what we'll cover next week. We've been given great opportunities. And... Jesus talks about the hospital being for the sick. Church is built for the sick. We're all in the process of being shaped and grown up into the image of Christ. But the, the, the question is an intimate question that we have to ask ourselves. Am I progressing? Am I stagnant? Have I really been transformed? Because scripture says, whether you are saved, sealed. The evidence of whether we are progressing is, are we lining up with the word of God? Are we doing what our king has asked us to do as ambassadors? Are we fulfilling our obligations as ambassadors? Not carrying around our membership card so that we can get in the gate. Don't want to throw this out there. And then, like, it's a bummer the rest of the day. But God. We see this, right? Continuous failures, and if we examine our lives, man, I messed up again. But God, in his great mercies, has provided another opportunity. Isn't that awesome? Today, right now, we're not promised another hour. Today, right now. Thank the Lord for his goodness. Square up accounts. And serve today. Let's pray.
Lord Jesus, we thank you. I thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your patience, God. Your patience with us. We should be just overwhelmed by your continuous goodness in our life, your faithfulness, and just surrender to your will because we are so grateful for what you have done. There is no line. There is no serving you up to this point. There is complete surrender. God, show us the way in which we should go. Lead us by your Holy Spirit. We are no longer slaves to sin. We are not captives by it. Let us operate in freedom and serve our King. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. We're so thankful for you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.